Darwin's Doubt Reviews, Part 4. The uh, specific subject we'll be covering is uh, the question was Meyer's article on the Cambrian Explosion in 2003 fairly excluded from the peer reviewed literature? Uh, the or article in question is The Origin of Biological Information and the Higher Taxonomic Categories, <coughs> published in the Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington in uh, 2004. And uh, there are several questions that uh, come out of that. Is the scientific community fair or biased? Is peer review what it's cracked up to be? Can intelligent design related articles really pass peer review? And uh, was Richard Sternberg an honest, careful man who was unfairly persecuted, or was he a charlatan who got his just desserts? And of course, You'll hear both sides of that particular argument. Um, the references we'll be looking for, first the article itself can be found at the discovery.org uh, web address. The original response of Alan Gishlick, Nick Matsky, and Wesley Ellsbury can be found in two places. Um, but the one that they feel is the most important one is uh, pandasthumb.org. Uh, the response by Steve Meyer, of course, is in Darwin's Doubt, Chapter 11. And then finally, the response by Nick Matsky. Uh, you know what? I misspelled that. <coughs> uh, I think it's a Z. But. Um, in Panda's Thumb. The origination of organismal form is an unsolved problem. This is the original article, and I'm just summarizing it very rapidly um, so that you know where it's coming from. Um, there's a whole bunch of supporting detail to this. Um, some of this is his wording, some of this is my own, but it, the, the intention is to summarize, and so. I'm not trying to quote here. Uh, this is particularly true of the higher taxonomic forms. He makes that claim and he supports it with uh, literature references. The Cambrian explosion took five to ten million years, which he considers geologically sudden, and I think most people would as well. The new forms require the information. This information is highly unlikely to have arisen by chance, and therefore, neo-Darwinism is inadequate to explain new body plans. Remember that um, natural selection can only select from the information that's already there. It cannot create new information. In fact, all it can do is destroy defective information. Self-organization, he mentions Stuart Kaufman, also is not adequate to explain information in new body plans, and he explains why. He thinks that's the case. Punctuated equilibrium is also inadequate. Um, structuralism is inadequate. Uh, interestingly enough, structuralism was the uh, theory of evolution that Richard Sternberg particularly supported. It would be interesting to know, but I don't know that we have that information, uh, whether this particular section was there beforehand or whether uh, uh, Sternberg insisted that it be put in. Uh, because, you know, otherwise you haven't dealt with one theory. Uh, cladism is inadequate, and he gives reasons for that. And finally, he talks about channeled and teleological evolution. Now, by the way, structuralism is kind of an idea that things kind of are channeled into specific structures because of the uh, uh, because they're required to, to be that way, not because there is a uh, uh, a particular mechanism behind that makes it that way. It's kind of like saying water 
flows in channels, tends to flow in channels, and once the channels get dug, they're pretty hard to get out of. And so evolution is kind of a, an inevitability in, in that uh, way of looking at things. And teleological uh, evolution may sound kind of strange, but um, as he quotes uh, Simon Conway Morris, evolution might be, quote, underpinned by a purpose. Now at this point, some of you are doing kind of a double take and saying, wait a minute, um, that sounds suspiciously like intelligent design. Well, as a matter of fact, Meyer basically takes off at that point and says he likes teleological evolution. He thinks that maybe that's how it happened. And he cites a whole bunch of works by intelligent design supporters. Now, one of the things that that does is if this article remains in the peer-reviewed literature, it means that, for example, Darwin's Black Box by Michael Behe has been cited in the peer-reviewed literature and therefore has to be answered. And see, one of the things that people are trying to do is to keep that whole question off the table. And so this is one, uh, you know, one thing that cannot be allowed to stand if you're going to make the argument that intelligent design is wacko science or pseudoscience or whatever you want to call it. He, uh, Steve Meyer notes that te teleology is in fact adequate to explain features that are not explained by competing theories. And um, he gives a list of those. And he concludes that, and I'm quoting him now, an experience-based analysis of the causal powers of various explanatory hypotheses suggests purposiveness or intelligent design as a causally adequate and perhaps the most causally adequate explanation for the origin of the complex specified information required to build the Cambrian animals and the novel forms they represent. So that's how he finishes the paper. Well, of course, there's this huge brouhaha, and among other things, um, uh, Sternberg wound up with people doing petty things to him, sometimes things that were obstructive. Um, and finally, after years and years of fighting it, uh, and in a congressional investigation that concluded that he had been hounded for uh, what the congressional in investigation felt was no particularly good reason, um, he wound up uh, finally leaving his job. A um, number of other things happened as well. Um, this is a, a, a real pain in the neck for somebody who had earned himself two doctorates in biology, one of them which was evolutionary biology. And uh, of course, the other thing happened was that this particular paper was retracted. It was officially retracted by the uh, Biological Society of Washington. That's Washington, D.C. And so uh, the, the interesting thing of it is that the reason for retracting it uh, kind of sounded quasi-religious. Um, Science isn't supposed to be this way. So here's, um, uh, there was no response in the peer-reviewed literature at all. No, uh, not by the Biological Society of Washington, not by anybody else. They didn't want to dignify it with the response. And you see, of course, since it's no longer officially part of the peer-reviewed literature, um, it just doesn't exist. now. Um, it got put on the internet, so you can't make it disappear that easily. But, um, but nobody responded to it in the peer-reviewed literature, and we may find out a little piece of that answer. One of them is, of course, if you respond to it, then it's, it officially does become part of the peer-reviewed literature <coughs> because it's cited. Um, uh, and then people have to talk about it, and they have to actually give good responses. Well, uh, Nick Matsky, 
realizes that these kind of controversies absolutely do need a response. I say that because he's responded in two other places that are important. Uh, one of them is uh, a, what he calls detailed, which is actually just an outline form of the response to uh, how do you make a flagellum. And it's all hypothetical and it involves whole proteins being uh, used, but it's at least it's a start. It's more than anybody else has done. And I give him credit for that. And he did the same thing about the origin of life. I think he did poorly. I think he doesn't understand all of the uh, difficulties with the theory, but at least he tried. And he condemns people that just say, oh, you know, there's lots of evidence, but I'm not going to bother to give it. Because he says rightly that that kind of response infuriates people who are sitting on the fence trying to figure out what's going on and saying, where's the evidence? So um, he took it on himself and apparently got two friends to help him out. Um, and put a response on, uh, and it was put on, uh, first on Panda's Thumb, and then later on it went to, uh, um, I think it's Talk Reason or something like that. Um, and uh, I'm going to quote passages, sort of like I have done before, where we don't, uh, where I won't be quoting the entire thing, but at least that you'll get um, you'll get his own words, or their own words, since there are three of them. Um, he start, they, uh, after a little bit of an introduction, they say, we congratulate ID on finally getting an article in a peer-reviewed biology journal, a mere 15 years after the publication of the 1989 ID textbook of Pandas and People, a textbook aimed at inserting ID into public schools. A um, little bit of snark there, uh, but at least overtly uh, saying, good for you, at least you put something up. And then they go on to say, there is no positive account of intelligent design presented, just as in all previous works on intelligent design. Um, Another little snippet, the Cambrian explosion is a standard topic for anti-evolutionists. There are several reasons for this. Uh, notice not intelligent design advocates, notice not creation is just um, anybody who's against evolution. Uh, many taxa make their first appearance in the Cambrian explosion. The amount of time within the period of the Cambrian explosion is geologically brief. And we have limited evidence from both within and before the Cambrian explosion on which to base analysis. Now I want you to notice that when the three of them are writing right now, they don't challenge the time factor for the Cambrian explosion. They will later, but not now. And um, again, now I've gotten tired of just putting quotes over everything, so I just, um, from here on out, this is direct quotes with ellipses where, uh, not necessarily between paragraphs, but at least bet uh, if, if I quote only part of a paragraph. Problems with Meyer's discussion of the Cambrian explosion. Meyer tries to evaluate morphological evolution by counting taxa, a totally meaningless endeavor for investigating the evolution of morphology. Most paleontologists gave up taxa counting long ago and moved on to more useful realms of research regarding the Cambrian. So it doesn't matter whether, you know, two-thirds of the phyla or more show up in the Cambrian first, and the ones that don't show up are ones that don't show up anywhere in the fossil record but are found at present, pr presumably because they're small, soft-bodied things. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Meyer repeats the claim that there are no transitional fossils for the Cambrian phyla. This is a standard ploy of the young Earth creationists, Cepedian and Angelic, uh, 1994, extended discussion of this tactic and its problems. Um, Meyer shows a complete lack of understanding of both the fossil record and the transitional morphologies it exhibits. Even during the Cambrian explosion, 
a recent example of transitional forms in the Cambrian explosion, see Shu et al., 2004. Now, I want you to notice, if there are transitional forms in the Cambrian explosion, that still doesn't explain why there are none before. And trilobites show up full tilt. So, uh, it's not just a question of lack of intermediates, Cambrian. It's, it's a question that you have s such major changes occurring in such a short time. I know it's a double problem. It's 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 a double problem, and I don't think he's. The, I don't think they are uh, answering the entire question, but whatever. Three, Meyer attempts to argue that the gaps in the fossil record reflect an actual lack of ancestor of sort of Cambrian phyla and subphyla. Well, isn't that kind of the first assumption? Uh, to support this, Meyer cites some papers by University of Chicago researcher Mike Foote. However, of the two papers by Foote cited by Meyer, neither deals with the Cambrian Precambrian records. One concerns the middle and late Paleozoic records of crinoids and brachiopods, the other Mesozoic record of mam mammal clade divergence, or even transitional fossils. So you see, you can't compare the Cambrian with anything else. Well, isn't that part of the point? <laughs> uh, Foote's paper deals with issues uh, that this is not a new paragraph. This is a continuation of the same paragraph, and I forgot to omit the star. Foote's papers deal with issues of taxonomic sampling. How well does a fossil record sample for a given time period reflect the biodiversity of that period? Well, that's kind of an important question, and especially if you're looking at the Cambrian and the Precambrian, right? Foote's conclusions are that we have a good handle on past uh, biodiversity and that divergence times probably match appearance in the fossil record relatively closely. Which means the Cambrian explosion is a real problem if you transfer it out. But Foote's work utilizes organisms that are readily preserved. It doesn't deal with organisms that aren't res readily preserved, a trait that almost certainly applies to the neuromicroscopic soft bodied ancestors of the Cambrian animals. Uh, okay, but what about those sponge embryos? Haven't dealt with that. Information and misinformation. Meyer invokes Dembski's specified complexity, complex specified information, as somehow relevant to the Cambrian explosion. However, under Dems Dembski's technical definition, CSI is not just the conjoint, words, conjoint use of the non-technical words specified as in functional and complexity, as Meyer erroneously asserts. According to Dembski's technical definition, improbability of appearance under natural causes is part of the definition of CSI. Only after one has determined that something is wildly improbable under natural causes can one include, conclude that something has CSI. And so if we, if we know or we have faith that really this can be done by evolution, then there is no such thing as CSI. Meyer relies on Dembski's specified complexity, but even if he used it correctly by rigorously applying Dembski's filter criteria and probability calculations, Dembski's filter has never been demonstrated to be able to distinguish anything in the biological realm. It has never been successfully applied to anyone, by anyone to any biological phenomenon. Um, Ellsbury and Shallot, 2003. Now, in case you're wondering, Ellsbury and Shallot is an internet article. It's not part of the peer-reviewed literature. But, you see, we're not in the peer-reviewed literature anyway, so why does it, it doesn't matter. Now, I'm going to skip over three because it's the same as, uh, basically, it's re-arguing one from a slightly different angle. And for he talks about cell types are not specified complexity, and he goes on to say, uh, this may be an estimate of something, the number of cell types in an organism, and at least signals some, kind, some sort of quantitative approach. But we may be certain that the quantity found has nothing to do with Dembski CSI. And therefore, it doesn't count as an argument. 
Now he goes, they go into a new uh, section of Texas and peptides. The evolution of new genes has been observed close in the lab, in the wild, inferred in great detail between closely related modern species, and reconstructed in hundreds of cases by comparing the genomes from organisms sequenced in genome projects over the last decade. See Long 2001 and related articles and below. And if you click that, you will get to a PubMed search with everything just kind of listed and they, you get to sort it out. In other words, they're not going to help you with your research by saying, oh, this article says this, this article says that, this article says that. What this article, this is basically a, a literature bluff. The analogy between language and biological sequence is poor for many reasons. Um, one of them being that you can have two proteins with 80% sequence divergence that will do the same job. And if you try to do that with English, you can't do it. Of course, um, you probably can do that. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play. Oh, do donate to me an estate where the bison wander, where the elk and the pronghorn gambol. I don't know if that's 80%, but it's pretty close. <laughs> Means exactly the same. <clears throat> um, Meyer cites Denton, 1986, unhesitatingly. This is surprising because while Denton advocated in 1986 that biology adopt a typological view of life, he has abandoned this view. So, if Meyer cites Denton and then Denton later says, well, I, I think I was wrong, then the reasons that, that Denton said originally can't possibly be valid. Interesting uh, line of logic. Meyer's case that the evolution of new genes and proteins is essentially impossible relies on just a few references from the scientific literature. Um, yeah, well, they're kind of the only ones where people have actually tested to see what uh, happens to random uh, changes. There's a large mass of evidence supporting the view that proteins are far less specified than Meyer asserts. Fully reviewing this would require an article in itself. Now, later on, they will promise a thorough review, but uh, the thorough review will never happen. The origin of novel genes, proteins by Meyer makes his case. Oh, I'm sorry. The origin of novel genes, proteins, and then I should have uh, put a return. Meyer makes his case that evolution can't produce new genes in complete neglect of the relevant scientific literature documenting the origin of new, new genes. Uh, one, a central claim of Meyer's is that novel genes have too much CSI to be produced by evolution. The first problem with this is that Meyer does not demonstrate that genes have CSI under Dembski's definition, see above. The second problem is that Meyer cites absolutely none of the literature documenting the origin of new genes. It is worth listing, if you in text, to make crystal clear the kinds of references that Meyer missed. And this one, by the way, is fourth out of a series of nine but seems to be the one on which Meyer seizes when we get to chapter 11, and the one in which Nick, Nick Madsky, when he's replying to Meyer, seems to accept as a reasonable central article. And we'll look at that article eventually. Meyer cites Axe, 2000, as a counter to the evolutionary scenario of successful modifications of genes leading to new protein products. But Axe, 2001, is not in any sense about successive modifications. Axe modified proteins in several locations at a time. I mean, he didn't wait until they were selected? Uh, <laughs> he changed two or three or four or five different amino acids at the same time and s saw whether, in fact, the... Uh, 
pro uh, the protein still functioned in the original function? And the answer is uh, not as much of the time as an evolutionist would like to believe. Well, uh, that seems to me to be a rational way of going about things. Um, but Meyer portrays protein function as all or nothing, which certainly this, uh, when Meyer wrote uh, Darwin's Doubt, he made it very clear that it's not all or nothing, that, that there are gradations. But protein function is not all or nothing. Recent research highlights several evolutionary mechanisms tinkering with existing genes to arrive at new genes. And uh, give some references, but you won't learn about that from Meyer. Well, but sometimes there is nothing. And that's the point that I think is being missed. As far as we can tell, Meyer uses the, term, the word duplication or something similar only twice in the entire 26-page article. One of these usages is in the reference, references in the title of an article referring to centriole duplication. The other is on page 217, where Meyer introduces the genes from unnecessary DNA scenario. So he doesn't talk about gene duplication and then divergence. If we might be permitted a prediction, Meyer or his defenders will respond by not admitting their error on this point, but by engaging in calculated mm -hmm. obfuscation over the definition of the word novel and fundamentally. They will then assert that after all, yes, evolution can produce new genes and new information, but not fundamentally new genes. They will never clarify what exactly counts as fundamental novelty. The power of negative thinking. Negative argumentation against evolutionary theories seems to be the sole scientific content of intelligent design. That observation continues to hold true for this paper by Meyer. Well, of course, the positive is so obvious. Biological or, uh, this biology is a study of organisms that uh, give the appearance of being designed for a purpose. Just because you don't think that eventually sways all of it doesn't mean it isn't evidence. Meyer gives no support for his assertion that PE punctuated equilibrium <coughs> proponents propose species selections to account for large morphological jumps. Use of the sing singular punctuated equilibrium is a common feature of anti-evolution writing. It is relatively less common among evolutionary biologists who utilize the plural form punctuated equilibria as it was introduced by Eldridge and Gould in 1972. Um, obviously a very powerful point there. Meyer makes the false claim that PE was supposed to address the problem of the origin of biological information or form. I don't think he makes the point that it was supposed to. He makes the point that it doesn't. Meyer also makes a false claim that PE was supposed to address the origin of taxa higher than species. Well, again, he makes the point it doesn't. Meyer makes the false claim that genetic algorithms require a target sequence to work. Uh, they do require a target function. On the other hand, the view Meyer, uh, on the other hand, the view Meyer fails to consider. When Meyer states that a massive increase in information is required to create all the body plans of the living phyla, he is implying that evolution had to go from a single-celled creature to a complex metazone in one step, which would be impossible. But the origin of metazones is not a case of zero to metazone instantly. Rather, it involves a series of incremental morphologic steps. The problem with trilobites, as another website pointed out, is that they are trilobites. That is, there are no known half trilobites, quarter trilobites, three quarter trilobites. They just appear in the Cambrian. And they appear with very complex eyes. With very complex eyes, yes, they do. They do. A long walk off a short peer review. Now, by the way, this is for a site that is supposed to avoid ad hominem arguments. 
The Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington is a respected, if somewhat obscure, biological journal specializing in papers of a systematic and taxonomic nature, um, such as the description of new species. A review of, a review of issues in evolutionary theory is decidedly not its typical fare, even disregarding the creationist nature of Meyer's paper. So he published it in the wrong journal. That was the problem. The fact that the paper is both one of the journal's typical sphere of publication, both out of the tip journal's typical sphere of publication, as well as dismal scientifically, raises the question of how it made it past peer review. The answer probably lies in the editor, Richard von Sternberg. Sternberg happens to be a creationist and Ivy fellow traveler. Have, are you or have you ever been a communist? <laughs> <coughs> Have you been to communist meetings? Um, Sternberg happened to be interested in, uh, in what they had to say, but not convinced of what they had to say. And I still don't think he's convinced of what they had to say. Who's on the editorial board of the Baronmanology Study Group at Bryan College in Tennessee. I've omitted a bunch, probably another half paragraph there that goes on to say, in a, be very, very snarky about Sternberg's opinions and everything. Um, obviously, an ad hominem argument, but whatever. And then he finishes with saying, one wonders if the paper ha saw peer review at all, despite the fact that Sternberg said it did. Basically, they're wondering whether Sternberg is a liar. I mean, he's a creationist after all, and they lie for Jesus, even though Sternberg is a Jew and not really a creationist, but, you know. Um, whether or not editorial discretion was abused in order to enable intelligent design to make a coveted appearance in the peer-reviewed scienti scientific literature. Notice, you see, this is, they know what the stakes are. You get, uh, you get ID into the literature, you have to actually deal with the arguments. And you can't deal with them in this kind of snarky way that cites your own internet papers as evidence. That could never pass peer review, by the way. Is not, th that is not currently known and is, at any rate, not the most important issue. The important issue is whether or not the paper makes any scientific contribution. Does it propose a positive explanatory model? If the paper is primarily negative critique, does it accurately review the science it purports to criticize? The fact that a paper is shaky on these grounds is much more important than the personalities involved. Intemperate response, and this is one of the points I think Matsky, even though I think he doesn't see some things clearly that he really should, he, this is something that I think that he saw pretty clearly early on. Intemperate responses will only play into the hands of creationists who might use these as an excuse to say that the, quote, dogmatic Darwinian thought police, end quote, are fairly giving, unfairly giving Meyer and PBSW a hard time. Nor should Sternberg be given the chance to become a martyr for the cause. Unfortunately for Nick Matsky, um, oh, wiser heads did not prevail. Uh, just a comment about uh, if paper is probably negative critique and so on, does it actually review the science and so on? Um, part of the scientific method is testability. And if you come out of something negative, this is not important. It's very important. That's right. Conclusion. There is nothing wrong with challenging conventional wisdom. Continuing challenge is a core feature of science, but challengers should at least be aware of, read, cite, and specifically rebut the actual data that supports conventional wisdom, not merely construct a rhetorical edifice out of omission of relevant facts, selective quoting, bad analogies, knocking down straw men, and tendentious interpretations. Unless and until the intelligent design movement does this, they are not seriously in the game. They're not even playing the same sport. So that's how it finishes. Well, what did Steve Meyer do? He defended. 
Despite the intense furor, which he's documented a little bit earlier in chapter 11, there was no formal scientific response to my article. Neither the Proceedings nor any other scientific journal published a scientific reputation. The members of the Council of the Biological Society of Washington, who oversaw the publication of the journal, insisted that they didn't want to dignify it by responding. Uh, eventually, two scientists and a science education policy advocate, each associated with the National Center for Science Education, a group that lobbies for teaching evolution in the public schools, stepped forward. You didn't know that this was all part of the NCSC, did you? <coughs> The three authors, geologist Alan Gishlik, education policy advocate Nicholas Matsky, and wildlife biologist Wesley Ellsbury. Nick has finally got himself a PhD, by the way. Um, published a response to my article on talkreason.org, a prominent atheistic website. Now, it turns out that it was actually published in Pandas Thumb, as we'll find out shortly. Although the website's guidelines prohibit ad hominem arguments, the rule is somewhat loosely enforced in the case of Gislick, Matsky, and Ellsbury's response, which they titled Meyer's Hopeless Monster. Gislick, Matsky, and Ellsbury attempted to refute my central argument by citing a scientific paper that they said solved the problem of the origin of genetic information. The paper, a scientific review essay titled The Origin of New Genes, Gen Glimpses from the Young and Old, had appeared in Nature Reviews Genetics in 2003. Gishlik, Matsky, and Ellsbury asserted that this paper, co-authored by Manuel Long, an evolutionary biologist at the University of Chicago, and several colleagues, was representative of an extensive, quote, scientific literature documenting the origin of new genes, end quote. The off-cited Long paper points to a variety of studies that purport to explain the evolution of various genes. These studies typically began by taking a gene and then seeking to find other genes that are similar or homologous to it. They then seek to trace the history of slightly different homologous genes back to a hypothetical common ancestor gene or genes. To do this, the study surveyed databases of gene sequences looking for similar sequences and representatives of different taxonomic groups, often in closely related species. Um, notice that this isn't, uh, there's no attempt to find what the intermediates are. And in, in some cases, you'll see that there are basically no intermediates, that it's all a one-time deal. Uh, upon closer examination, however, none of these papers demonstrate how mutations in natural selections could find truly novel genes or proteins in sequence space in the first place. Nor do they show that it is reasonably probable or plausible that these mechanisms would do so in the time available. The scenarios that the long paper cites, at best, I'm using that so you know what they means. They provide hypothetical after the fact con reconstructions of a few events out of a sequence of many supposed events, starting with the existence of a presumed common ancestor gene. But that gene itself does not represent a hard data point. It is inferred to have been existed on the basis of the similarity of two or more other existing genes, which are the only actual pieces of observational evidence upon which these often elaborate scenarios are based. And when, so what he's pointing out is that some of this is data, actual hard data that you could reproduce in the lab. And some of it is interpretation. Sometimes reasonable interpretation, sometimes stretching it, sometimes unreasonable. Nearly all of the scenarios developed in the papers at Long Sites start with an inferred common ancestral gene from which two or more modern genes diverged and developed. These scenarios treat the similarity of sequence, the information, in two or more genes as unequivocal evidence for a common ancestral gene. You see, if you don't have <coughs> a designer, then the only thing that can create those similarities is common ancestry or convergent evolution. Those are the only two choices you got. And convergent evolution would seem to be very difficult. And so common ancestry would be obviously the choice you'd make. These scenarios treat the similarity of sequence, the information, in two or more genes as unequivocal evidence for a common ancestral gene, which they would be if you knew there was no designer. 
Standard methods of phylogenetic reconstruction presuppose rather than demonstrate that biological similarity results from shared ancestry. Yet as we saw in chapter six, similarity of sequence by itself is not always an unequivocal indicator of common ancestry. Now, at this point I would say you really need to deal with does it look like there's pretty good evidence that it's common ancestry because uh, proof is difficult in science in general. And so saying that something's not proved is not necessarily a really good argument. In addition, it is possible that similar genes might have been separately designed to meet similar functional needs in different organisms in little contexts. Viewed this way, similarity of sequence does not necessarily reflect design with modification from a common ancestor, but could reflect design in accord with common functional considerations, constraints, or goals. Some genes and the information rich sequences they contain must most certainly cannot be explained by reference to the kind of scenarios that Long cites. All of these scenarios attempt to explain the origin of two similar genes by reference to descent with modification via mutation from common ancestral genes. Yet genomic studies are now turning up hundreds of thousands of genes in many diverse organisms that exhibit no significant similarity in sequence to any other known gene. These are the famous orthogen genes. Evolution ex nihilo. And um, we'll come back to the long paper after we get done, and you'll see that that is actually a term they use. Well, they actually use de novo. Long does, not, uh, Long does cite at least one type of mutation that does not presuppose existing genetic information, the de novo origination of new genes. I should have italicized that. For example, one paper he discusses sought to explain the origin of a promoter region for a gene, the part of the gene that helps initiate the transcription of the gene's instructions, and found that this unusual regulatory region did not really evolve. Instead, it somehow snapped into being. It was aboriginal, created de novo by a fortuitous juxtaposition of suitable sequences. Many other papers invoke de novo origination of genes. Long mentions, for example, study seeking to explain the origin of an antifreeze protein in an Antarctic fish that cites de novo amplification of a short DNA sequence to spawn a novel protein with a new function. Likewise, Long cites an article in Science to explain the origin of two human genes involved in neurodevelopment that appealed to de novo generation of building blocks, single genes or gene segments coding for protein domains, where an exon spontaneously originated from a unique non-coding sequence. Other papers make similar appeals. Paper in 2009 reported, this is after Long's paper, the de novo origin of at least three human protein coding genes since the divergence with chimps, where each of them has no protein coding homologs in any other genome. An even more recent paper in PLOS Genetics reported 60 new protein coding genes that originated de novo on the human lineage since divergence from the chimpanzee, a finding that was called a lot higher than a previous admittedly conservative estimate. 60 new proteins from scratch. And so that's, that's the reply, and you notice that it leans heavily on these orphan genes. Uh, Manuel Long's paper doesn't deal with orphan genes. Well, let's see if Nick Matsky will deal with orphan genes. We put up our critical review stating that Meyer's article was substantially self-plagiarized from his previous works. Wait a minute. Um, now, of course, I haven't read to you the entire previous article, but I have read the entire previous article, and I didn't find that. Well, I did find something that if you wanted to interpret that way, you could. Meyer's article cited some of Meyer's previous articles. Oh, is that plagiarism when you quote yourself? Um, I, I guess you're never supposed to repeat anything. Pardon me? I guess you're never supposed to repeat anything that you've said once before. Um, 
Oh, well, was wrong on a number of specific issues. Of course, that's Matsky's opinion. And thus could not be considered a competent work of biology. So if you're wrong, you're not competent. That's an interesting view of science. Anybody who, if Newton was wrong, he's not competent. Okay. The, uh, the dichotomy is just amazing. And the peer review couldn't be considered competent either. Well, because they didn't pick up an incompetent paper. QED. But now, at long last, Meyer devotes a big chunk of chapter 11. I omitted a whole bunch of snark about uh, uh, response by Casey Luskin and so forth. Uh, Meyer devotes a big chunk of chapter 11 to rebutting one of the key arguments we made, namely that the origin of new genetic information by evolutionary processes is well documented and well understood. And this is demonstrated in part by a nice detailed review article by Long et al. Nature Reviews Genetic entitled The Origin of New Genes, Glimpses from the Young and Old. The paper has two nice big tables, one giving a review of the many mutational mechanisms, all of the mutational processes known to occur naturally in the lab involved in the production of new genes, and another giving examples, reviewing papers that had reconstructed the origin of new genes. Um, I notice that Matsky is not taking issue with the fact that Steve Meyer zeroes in on this particular paper. So apparently it is an important paper and it's worth taking that one out of the list of nine and out of the list of various other ones that scattered throughout it, the original reply. Meyer first, re uh, first reviews his 2004 paper and the Meyer's Hopeless Monster episode. Inaccurately, as it turns out, Meyer seems to say that Meyer's Hopeless Monster was first published on the atheist, talkreason.org website, and it was published late in the controversy over Meyer's PBSW article. In fact, if memory serves, the article was published here on PT first, and furthermore, it was the very first public notice that anyone made of the Meyer article. Well, of course, that doesn't say how late it was, but um, Meyer then just half-heartedly lists a couple of random complaints and a couple of vague and question-begging alternative explanations of the data. And by the way, when I went back to check, there is the paper on Pandas Thumb, there is the paper on Talk Reason, and they are, as far as I can tell, identical except for some formatting stuff. I didn't go through every single letter, so I can't swear. But it's, if it's not identical, it's very close. Well, doesn't that run against the well that's plagiarism, but we'll let it pass. <laughs> um, <clears throat> hypothetical reconstructions are not data. Never mind that the ID claim is that in no way, no how, can naturally and evolutionary processes produce new genetic information. Now, I want you to notice that this is, at least for some intelligent design people, erecting a straw man. In fact, those of you who've been here long enough may remember me uh, giving a talk called Evolution Works! Exclamation point, or something like that. Uh, outlining where four bases had been reinserted into a virus after they'd been taken out with no intelligent intervention. So, no way, no how can national, uh, natural evolutionary processes produce new genetic information and that the information is uniquely produced by intelligence, and never mind that all science is about proposing and testing hypotheses. Meyer's tactic in this chapter, emphasizing the words like postulate and suggest, is just juvenile, no better than what you get from the young earth creationist who just fell off the turnip truck to repurpose a description of YECs that uh, Meyer used to like to use. 
The common ancestral gene before a gene duplication is inferred rather than observed. Never mind phylogenetics and all the evidence for its reliability and rigor mentioned above. Also, never mind that the fact that in recently evolved cases, it, for example, Drosophila, and that should be italicized and probably my fault, um, we sometimes have the exact or near exact original ancestral gene sequence present. Also, never mind that gene duplications have been observed in the lab and natural polymorphisms in gene copy number are regularly observed in natural populations, including in humans. Never mind that the mutational mechanisms producing gene duplications, for example, equal, unequal crossing over, are also well understood and sometimes directly observed. Three, these papers assume the existence of an ancestral gene. In fact, the title of Myers chapter 11 is Assume a Gene. Never mind that when it comes to the Cambrian bilaterians, those are the, the Cambrian animals that just kind of pop out. Cnidarians, uh, we have oodles of evidence for pre-existing animals, cnidarians and sponges, well certainly sponges, both of which have lots of genes shared with other animals, as well as single-celled eukaryotes which have plenty of genes further back. Never mind that Meyer's informational argument hangs completely on it being a universal generalization with no exceptions. No, it doesn't. Just no major exceptions. That intelligence is the only source of new genetic information. Meyer rather randomly suggests that maybe convergence is an alternative explanation of the similarity of genes normally interpreted as duplicates. This is laughable even in the most extreme case of molecular convergence that Meyer can find, a hearing-related gene in bats and whales, which amount to maybe a dozen convergent sites out of hundreds if memory serves. Wait a minute. If I read that correctly, the gene that's in both bats and whales that is responsible for them to be able to hear ultrasound is in fact not convergence, then what is it? Sure. Lateral gene transfer? Just pure chance, which mathematically nearly impossible. <laughs> okay. So this is where this paper would do well with the little peer review. Then Meyer drags in this whopper. It is possible that similar genes might have been separately designed to meet similar function, mm -hmm. functional needs in different organismal contexts, italics original. Mm -hmm. Really, does Meyer really think that the designer monkey with the genome of one Drosophila species among thousands to produce SDIC and just happened to place it in between two genes that looked like they provided the ancestral gene chunks and just happened to litter the genome reason with other tell telltale sequence bits that indicate a typical mutation process, and then did some targeted reduction in genetic diversity to make it look like a selective sweep recently happened. Really? As a final point, I would note that even Michael Behe accepts the evolutionary origin of mere new genes with different functions, even ones that are now essential to a species and which cause death if deleted. See his June 13 post, a new gene fits in without a ripple. Complete and utter abject defeat for the idealist evolution can't produce new information argument. It is if you insist that there is no such thing as new information that could possibly come, uh, be, uh, let's say, selected out by the environment. But it isn't if you insist that, you know, Maybe one, maybe two, maybe three, maybe four mutations could be selected out in extraordinary circumstances, but beyond that, it's hopeless. And actually, I think the official uh, estimate of um, Behe and Snoke is six for bacteria. And then he says, oh, really, for IC as well, but that's another topic, so we'll leave that throwaway line alone. Perhaps dissatisfied with this phoning it in response to the work of hundreds of scientists documenting the origin of new genes, 
work, which has, by the way, greatly expanded since 2003. Even writing a review article now would be a much new, bigger task. Meyer then switches topics to orphans. Switches topics? This is part of the, part of the, uh, part of the problem, and perhaps it's the biggest problem for evolution. How do you make genes out of totally whole cloth? Here, he repeats the usual IDS problems with complete ignorance of the relevant statistical issues involving orphans and homology surfaces, searches between genomes, mm -hmm. as unfortunately can be found in some of the scientific literature on this su subject. You see, he disagrees with me, he's wrong. The scientific literature, a good share of it disagrees with me, so it must be wrong too, and you know, we'll just dismiss it. He just got his PhD. From now on, he'll become a little more humble, I think. <laughs> Meyer's last argument basically reverts to the improbability argument. Sequence space is large, functional space is small. This trumps all the above evidence, according to Meyer. It never occurs to Meyer that his assessment of the probability of functional sequences might just be wrong, and that the deluge of evidence that new in genetic information is easy to evolve is pretty direct evidence that his probability assessment is wrong. We talked about this uh, once when we went through and noted that uh, what he's saying is the, the evidence that, ev that uh, genetic information is easy to evolve is not actually watching it evolve in, time, in real time. It's actually saying sequence A was the parent of sequence B and um, so therefore evolution must have evolved from A to B. and not asking the question of maybe design had something to do with it. These people are mixing up whether something has changed with what caused the change. Elsewhere in the book, Meyer invokes some other arguments to justify the improbability of functional sequence arguments. These are Behe's and Snook's 2004 arguments about multiple simultaneous mutations. Behe's ed edge of evolution argument about chloroquine complexity clusters and protein protein binding sites and work by Douglas Axe and Ann Gager run out of the Discovery's approximately two-person research institute, the Biological Institute, which typically involves making evolutionary observed modifications to proteins and then showing that they don't work. Mm, that's uh, stretching the case a little bit. And um, the other thing is that, they, that I think there's a mistake that's being made here, and that is that they don't deal with Dirt and Schmidt, who are on their side and who admit that it takes millions of years to get a hundred, hundred million years or thereabouts to get a new gene for humans, uh, uh, or to get two mutations, the first of which is neutral. And if that's the case, then every single mutation for humans must have been advantageous. Go ahead. I notice how he denigrates Discovery Institute as being essentially a two-person research institute, um, while at the same time other evolutionists are lamenting the fact that the Re Discovery Institute is the pain in everybody's <laughs> neck. I'm wondering how is it possible that a uh, two-person research institute provides so much pain to everybody's neck? Because they're picking the low-hanging fruit, that's why. And there's lots of low-hanging fruit. That's the problem. Anyway, most of this has been rebutted elsewhere on PT, and there is this little, and there's little point in doing it again. So when he gets done, he's not going to answer the question. That's already been done before. No sites, no, you know, here's where you can get further information, just whatever. It is pretty strange, though, that most of these talking <coughs> points were invoked in a sim very similar way in last year's DI book on human origins. It looks like they will throw in some Behe and X just about anywhere. Well, if it's important, it's groundbreaking, why not? 
why your opponents are li limited to listing it just once just amazes me. The multiple required mutation stuff, by the way, is basically just Behe's refuted irreducible complexity argument. This guy is an argument about sequence evolution. And it's only relevant if it can be shown that two or more neutron mutations ever were required for anything relevant to the Cambrian explosion. Wow. Yeah. Go ahead. Doesn't it sound like the evolutionists keep throwing the Darwin into just about anywhere? So what, I don't understand what the argument here is. Well, see, the argument is there are Darwinian sequences. Everybody knows it. I can't tell you where they are. I don't have any actual references for them. But there are Darwinian sequences. And with Darwinian sequences, why are we fighting this battle? That's what it boils down to. And once you understand that that is the core of the argument, does each new mutation give you an added advantage? And if the answer is no, you've got to quit. Well, actually, technically, you can probably get by with maybe six in bacteria. But for humans, you're only allowed one. Every, <coughs> advantage, every mutation has to have an advantage. And yet they're not into de demonstrating how every single mutation that changes us from, uh, th that, that gives us, um, let's say, better brains, that every single one is advan advantageous. And you have to get rid of all the bad ones. Oh, yeah. This is, of course, not mentioning genetic entropy at all. I don't think genetic entropy is even on Nick Matsky's um, radar. Mm -hmm. He has no realization. Well, let's go look at Long's article, just, and, then, and then we'll open up the floor. Long's article has, I'm not even going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to show you a couple of his, um, this is molecular mechanisms for creating new gene structures, and I'm going to take that off and put the bottom on so you can see it a little better. And one of them is exon shuffling, taking an exon out of one gene and plopping it into another gene. One is the, this, the I'm surprised that this isn't the first one, because this is the one that's always cited. Classic gene duplication, you duplicate the gene A, and then this gene goes out of circulation and eventually becomes gene B. This is kind of an interesting one. Retroposition, new gene duplicates are created in new genomic positions by reverse transcription. Now, the reason why it doesn't show it as well here, but the reason why that it can be seen to be the case is that usually there are a couple of exons here. They will be joined with the introns cut out in RNA but some of that, sometimes that RNA will be retranscribed back into the genome. And so instead of having three pieces like this, the second copy will be all one piece. And maybe even with a poly A tail on the end of it. Now, can that happen? I think we have to say no. yes. And I think some of our t talks from the last week and the week before argue that yes, you can take RNA and plop it back into the genome. And maybe that wasn't even originally intended, but it certainly happens now. Ah, here's another one that uh, last two weeks are interesting as a background. Mobile element, a mobile element also known as transposable element sequence is directly recruited by the host gene. Mobile genetic element inserts, gets cut pieces out, and eventually becomes a little piece here. ALU or whatever. So it happens, and um, notice that HLA-DR1 is one of those. Um, that's human histocompatibility locus <coughs> A. And then uh, lateral gene transfer. Organism B, and then, or, and then it's, uh, it, it may diverge afterwards. It may not. Um, yes, 
a question here. Just a minute. You took, you took these. Uh, If you took these uh, particular, uh, say, mobile elements, and you took uh, specimens from, say, a half a dozen or a dozen different human beings from the same area, would you find necessary? You find all of them are going to be in this type of arrangement, or pre-arrangement, or after arrangement, or none at all. Well, my understanding is that there's, uh, according to over this, here, this can happen. it generates 4% of new exons in human protein coding genes. So it's a fairly significant invasion, but certainly not the majority, if that helps. It happens often, but it doesn't happen Yeah, and do the they time. know why this happens? Yeah. Maybe because they're designed to get in there and um, add information that wasn't there before. But yeah. not necessarily but they, the information but they that you really detect want. What that information is. Um, then you can have gene fusion or fission, where two genes that were together become separate or vice versa, with adding material in between them, including a, something to transcribe this one. And they have some examples. Uh, this is not very common, but it has does happen. And then finally, de novo origination. Now, they do have some examples, and the first one is this antifreeze glycoprotein that is found in certain Antarctic fish mm -hmm. and also separately, probably by a separate mechanism in cod, which of course are swim in cold Atlantic <coughs> waters. And of interest, one can, in that particular case, outline a sequence where first you have a, a mutation that uh, doubles something, so it does, <coughs> doesn't cause harm anyway, and then you have a mutation that starts cutting off pieces of it and then starts adding new s sequences. And in that kind of a scenario, each step actually does improve the fish's ability to withstand cold. So here you have an actual <coughs> evolutionary sequence where each step gradually gets you better and better mm -hmm. able to stand cold. And of course, if your predators can't stand cold, then, uh, then they freeze and you win. Yes? Uh, just a question on uh, mobile elements and so on. Generates 4% of new exons in human protein coding genes. Is there experimental evidence for this or is it calculated on the basis of the assumption that man evolved? Well, it, it's calculated on the basis of this segment here <coughs> being identical to the central segment of ALU or some other. How long is that segment? Do you have any idea? Uh, that I can't tell you. I have, th I have not actually read all of the literature <coughs> on this. I, there's, there's one, uh, one piece, but it was kind of uh, written as a general outline rather than as a specific. And here's, you know, there are 180 bases and 160 of them are preserved or something like that. <coughs> it didn't really say that. Um, but they do have references, and uh, I've cut that off because the screen is only so big. Um, that are off on the side. If you get the article, you can find those. Uh, one more question. I was assuming, of course, that where there's a change to make a fish uh, be able to stand cold water, that when water warms up, like change in seasons, it goes back to the way it was. Um, that I don't know. What happens to cod when they swim outside of the cold water? Yeah. It's a good question. Um, I do know that, they, um, that the cod have the, the, the gene in it, and so do the Antarctic fish, and they probably got it separately. And, you know, there is, there is a limited role for evolution. If there is a change that's advantageous, it will get selected for. And sometimes the change will be one step different and that means that you're not drifting about, wandering aimlessly, trying to find the new place. 
you actually have an advantage right away. And that's the kind of thing that if it does happen, can be selected for quite easily. But it's a one-step mutation. You'll notice that all of these, for practical purposes, are one-step mutations except for this divergence. And this divergence could be neutral mutations, in which case it's not a big, in other words, mutations that equally well do the job. The, the question is, can you go from you know, enzyme A to enzyme B without loss of enzyme A's function um, and with some kind of guidance towards enzyme B? And if you can, then, then of course you can do this. If you can't, then this is highly um, uh, unlikely. Yes. Well, I think uh, one of the questions would be, uh, is this only certain fish and it stays there, or can it be like the Galapagos finches? The beaks actually change according to season and what type of uh, nut they have to eat or what they have. Okay, the fish swim in very cold water. It's cold enough to freeze. If, if they get ice crystals in the wrong places, the fish freeze and they die. No, that's they have a protein that has a repeat of three different amino acids. Uh, you know, three here, three here, three here, three here, three here. The longer the protein is, the better it is at scarfing up these ice crystals before they have a chance to spread throughout the fish. And it's called an antifreeze protein, and it works pretty well. You can take these fish and you can cool them down to colder temperatures without freezing them. Now you're going to ask, well, why isn't the water frozen too? Well, the water is salt water, and so it freezes at lower than um, standard fr uh, temperature. And that's the danger that the fish have. And they're actually swimming in water that if, if they had plain water, they would freeze. And in fact, if water leaks down from the ice into the, into the ocean, it, it freezes into some rather spectacular forms. Uh, so uh, this is colder than freezing water. Uh, but, uh, but the fish, have developed, and it's by advantageous mutations, each one of which is more advantageous than the next, um, the Santa Freeze. Now, the second, the second one I'm going to show you is not the uh, one that lists all the references, because that's kind of boring. But it's rather what they call Yellow Emperor turning into Jingwei which if you're Chinese, uh, you'll catch a, a, uh, uh, an allusion to, um, to um, an ancient legend. But the, you had the original s segment, you had it split into two copies, and in, one, uh, in several different um, uh, fruit flies. The, um, another protein came into here and then separated these two and these have all started to degenerate because they're no longer being selected for. This is genetic entropy in action. But in the meantime, these, which have to function now, uh, do something to the, to the fruit fly that is uh, evolutionary advantageous, and so they, and so this this stays. So you have two parts. Basically, you have two parts of a gene. Is what it amounts to. One part from here, one part from there, and they come together. And that probably did happen. But you notice that that's a one-step process. It only takes one mutation to do that. And see, this is the thing that I think Maskey is missing. Is that I don't care if you make a gene out of part A and part B, as long as it doesn't take, you know, 15 different steps to get there. And that's the real problem. If you're trying to change this, you know, uh, particular enzyme to that particular enzyme, and it takes 15 steps to get there, 
You can't do it in biological evolution uh, unless you have some kind of guidance somewhere. Anyway, now kind of my quick summary. I asked the question, is there a smooth pathway between one protein and the next? And there should be no need for genetic drift for large mammals like us or elephants or so forth. There can be no more than six mutations for a genetic drift for bacteria. And of course, smaller organisms, there's an intermediate number depending on how fast they multiply and so forth and how big their genome is. Evolution of up to four mutations has been demonstrated in the lab in viruses. We went over that once. So don't, don't say you can't get any new information because it's just not completely true. If you have an advantageous step-by-step -step process, each one being more advantageous than the next in some circumstances, then you can get an evolutionary step. And it has been demonstrated to happen in the lab for four new bases, or to be precise, four bases that were added back after they were clipped out deliberately by the researchers. It was tough. Evolution most of the time went other directions. But it can actually recreate something really spectacular if you give it enough oomph. Enough oomph is a mutation advantage of 10 to the 17th in this particular case, <laughs> which is not going to happen with humans. Um, any, any, any woman that has 10 to the 17th babies has got to be congratulated. Um, and I would ask, what is the edge of evolution? There is an edge. If you have a Petri dish with E. coli in it, and you walk in the next morning and there's a cockroach there, I guarantee you it did not evolve. And what's more, I don't think any evolutionist will tell you it did evolved either. There is an edge. The question is, where is that edge? And and do required changes in living creatures exceed it? And if they do, then you can argue, I think, very reasonably that evolution cannot explain all of life. New genes do not mean large amounts of new information. We've seen where you can take fusion of genes, you can take fission of genes. You, if you do a transfer, that's that's really not a step. I mean, that's, one, that's only one step to get there. And if the transfer produces an advantage, then it's no surprise that it's picked up and run with by the organism. I don't think unguided evolution has been demonstrated to be adequate to account for the variety of life on Earth or even life itself. Now, this is important. It hasn't been demonstrated. One could argue, and rationally so, that eventually it will be demonstrated. But it hasn't been demonstrated at this point. That means that people who propose other mechanisms should be listening, listened to. And I think that therefore the reaction to Meyer's article was, on the face of it, excessive. Even if Meyer is wrong. I don't think pure science would support this reaction. Certainly, when we're taught science, we're not taught that this is the reaction science should take to that kind of thing. Science is supposed to be open, right? That means that this is probably not coming from science in the pure sense. It's probably coming from philosophical or religious reasons, or if you want to put it that way, anti-religious reasons. And therefore, I think it's are very strongly arguable that Sternberg was, in fact, persecuted, that, in fact, this article was removed for inadequate reasons, and that what we are looking at is a closed-mindedness on the way science is being practiced today that belies its professions and its foundation. But that's my take. Now it's your turn.
Go ahead. Well, it seems to me that uh, some ways it's getting nitpicky, kind of like an argumentative, uh, hard to get along with old woman who complains about everything. Uh, you still have, I thought, evolution. The idea of evolution was to create new organisms. But it strikes me that uh, we're not creating new organisms. And, you know, if this happens in a cat for the next thousand years, we're going to still have a cat. And um, so they need to uh, go and say, this leads to that. There's some, what is the purpose of this? There's probably some purpose. But I, I get the feeling it's more like uh, adapting to, like immune system, adapting to, or fighting off some kind of disease that comes in. And uh, this is so small scale, they have really no explanation. You just think there's a change. Well, it's a little bit like saying that something can swim at a half a mile an hour, and therefore it can swim up a, a, a river that's flowing at 20 miles an hour. It's not going to happen. Yeah. And in some cases, the scale is even more than that. Let's say you can do four mutations. We can demonstrate that in the lab. Now you're trying to create something that has a hundred, two hundred amino acids and six hundred bases to do that. Plus the stop codon, plus the other stuff. And it's actually worse than that because the difficulty goes up with the exponential. It's comparing 2 to the 4th to 2 to the 600th. And 2 to the 600th is uh, literally astronomically large, and 1 over 2 to the 600 is astronomically small. They estimate that if you, if you have a chance, if you are able to hit a target that's one sixtieth, uh, one and two, uh, ten to the sixtieth. Well, this is one to four to the sixtieth. So, but it's pretty close. That that's equivalent of hitting a golf ball, a hole in one, across the size of the universe. So maybe it's equivalent to making a basket at, across the size of the universe. It's still pretty impressive. So anyway, next week we'll talk about uh, the creation debate. And uh, we'll have more details as to where you can view it if you haven't done so already. Bill Nye and uh, Ken Ham, or as it's sometimes irreverently referred to as Ham on Nye. <laughs> See you next.